I'm pleased to invite Ms. Jaya Balu, the CISO at KPN Telecom, uh, and also one of the top 100 CISOs in the world, okay, uh, working for many years in information security, mostly in global telecommunications, Verizon, France Telecom, and so on, and she wants me to stop, so please, <laughs> please welcome her for her presentation, which we might actually find here. Okay, thank you. Hey, so just, I mean, Arthur is amazing, but can I just ask, because I am just a simple computer scientist, uh, network architect, did you, ha did you guys, the ones of you that are not physicists, did you guys get all of that? Is there anyone? All is a relative term, well, all, not all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about some of the applied stuff here, and I'm just, oh, and I shouldn't do that. Uh, you know, like, why do we need a quantum computer? L let's talk about that for a second. So, does anybody have an idea about why we actually need a quantum computer? No, seriously. Other than to break crypto, why do we need a quantum computer? What? MP compute problems? Okay. Thank you. Simulating physics, exactly, and other scientific problems, right? Well, like, when we take a look at our own industry, um, you know, we all are familiar with Moore's Law. Like, the things that I, I hear about all the time is, if you want uh, to be faster than the biggest supercomputer on Earth, what you've got to do is just build another supercomputer. If you want to build a quantum computer and you want to double that, what do you do? And the physicists in this room know this already. Just add another qubit. Okay, so like, again, for the computer scientists, like me, um, so like we all know about bits, zeros and ones, quantum computers work with qubits, which is a zero and one superpositioned at the same time, yeah? So that's actually pretty darn funky, but if you think about the fact that we like judge a quantum computer about, you know, how, what can you do with those qubits, um, you basically have like this ability to increase your total amount of processing power. We're going to talk about that for a second. So if we say that we now know about the phenomenon of Moore's law, which is that every 16, 18 months you have a doubling of your total computing power, well we had that. That was kind of what we got used to. That's the cocaine hack, cr crack heroin that we were all addicted to uh, in the telecommunications industry and in the technology field. We love that. So the deal is that that's not happening anymore because we see the evidence of something called Amdahl's law, which is that we keep adding processors, but we don't have the relative uptake in actual computing power. So it's kind of, eh, not so much. Um, and that uh, phenomenon is something that we're going to have to counteract if we still want to have our, you know, quantum, nano, AI, blockchain-y, blah, 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 future. So um, we need it. Um, other than the fact that, you know, techies need it, um, there are some really uh, interesting applications that people want to use a quantum computer for. So, like, when you talk to people who I think are really inspiring, it's folks that are in the medical field who will tell you, we find it really difficult to simulate uh, how amino acids work and how protein folding occurs. We cannot do that with our current um, infrastructure. And in order to do those kinds of scientific problems and modeling, we really want to have a quantum computer so that we can do this kind of stuff, that we can predict this protein folding, and eventually it'll lead us to, you know, having earlier detection of, not just earlier detection of cancer, but potentially having, like, personalized medicine that will be tailored to each individual based on this. So I find that really darn cool. If that's the, the reason we need a quantum computer, I say let's build it. Um, oh, and I'm doing it again. Um, but if we talk about like cryptography, again, I'm dialing it back. I'm, I appreciate that some people might be like, duh, when I tell you this bit, but I, I want to dial it back for a reason. Everybody remembers what a prime number is, right? Yay. Okay. All right. So we, all of our current crypto is based on, I'm going to uh, bring it down to the fact that we, we base it on prime numbers. We, we multiply really, really large prime numbers together, and that is pretty cool. You know, when we want to actually have some sort of cryptographic thingy. 
Um, but what quantum computers can do, and that's thanks to Shor's algorithm, is they can already do, uh, if we had a quantum computer and we used Shor, integer factorization, which means that like, we can pretty much derive how we actually got the product of those primes. So uh, let's pick some prime numbers and do, th is everybody okay with what I'm saying now? All right, okay, so, and then discrete logs, uh, which we remember from high school math as like clock arithmetic, is when you basically have uh, the remainder, if you will, and you try to inverse uh, what you originally had in the formula. So like, we know this from cryptography lessons that we say the strength of this one, these both one-way functions depends on the time it takes to reverse it. So they're not irreversible, but they just take a lot of effort in order to go back to invert it. So thankfully we've got Shore, but we've also got Grover, which um, can actually optimize the time that it takes to search for the potential outcome by trying multiple possibilities at the same time. And then when you take a look at when, you know, like these qubits and these quantum computers, first of all, we have like different definitions. Not your quantum computer may not be the quantum computer because they have different definitions. IBM has a really nice uh, analysis where they have three types of quantum computer. Um, they have like an analog quantum computer and they have a, a mixed in between quantum computer and they have like the universal quantum computer. For the types of challenges that we want to look at, it's going to be the universal quantum computer which is like the thing that we want to solve all of these problems. And it's kind of the thing that you know IBM is also putting their money on as is Google. But if you take a look at D-Wave, it's, it's the more initial adiabatic type of quantum computer that is kind of like the first step to getting there. Um, but it's still capable already of solving some interesting problems. So when we want to look at how does it solve those problems, well, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on that topology of what type of quantum computer is it. It also depends on how many qubits does it have to actually solve this problem. And what it does is even when you take the recommendations of how you should be setting up your crypto, it can drastically reduce the amount of time required to reverse it from you know, like now we say it could take the lifetime of the universe to solve some of our cryptographic challenges. Having a quantum computer and applying shores, it could bring it down to a few seconds. And I think we kind of need to grapple with that idea in our heads um, because actually the NSA has been saying it for years. They already modified Suite B already for a few years. And if we take a look at what the impact is for our current crypto, um, it comes down to the fact that really... DSA, uh, elliptic curve, RSA is absolutely no longer secure and when it comes to like SHA for hashing functions or AS256, you really need to think about the fundamental fact that in this case, size matters. Um, and uh, we need larger key sizes and larger output. I, there was a gentle giggle in the front, thank you. I, I wasn't trying to go there, but um, yes. Uh, so. We really do need to kind of um, uh, figure out how to do this, but you know, it shouldn't be. It should be fair to say that it's not all elliptic curve is suddenly growing out the window. It's just the current types of uh, elliptic curves that we use. So if we have a post quantum elliptic curve, then we could be back in business for all of the crypto people that have worked on that. Do me again. Um, so Michelle Mosca's formula, I, I actually kind of uh, talk about this as well, but really fundamentally how long do we need to keep our crypto secure, um, how long before we have a viable quantum computer that breaks our secrets, and then how long do we need to transition. I always use the example of IPv6, which we've had for like a couple of decades, and how many of you are using IPv6 to surf all the things? We're not. So we are slow and sucky at adopting protocols and we are really negligent in appropriately understanding how to uh, have cryptography that meets the span of all the applications we use it for. For example, um, I, I just met a really nice guy at, the, at Cyber Week who is you know, using technology to try to take back genetic information that people have done you know, online. So really interesting company, but how long would he need to keep that information secret? A couple of decades? A lifetime? Your children's lifetime? His progeny and progeny and progeny's life? We don't know how to do that. We really do not know how to do that uh, from a quantum perspective or like from a um, uh, traditional cryptographic perspective. 
Um, and I think like fundamentally what we are looking at is a phased plan of defense. So if you put the cryptographers and the physicists in a room, and I've done that, you'll very likely have a, an argument. Again, seen it, done it, been there. And they will disagree about the applicability about some of these um, quantum solutions or the cryptographic solutions. And again, you'll have the, it's not proven versus it's not practical, you know, and all, all of these debates will happen. But I think the, the thing that I believe in as a CISO of a telco is be opportunistic. It's not about choosing the best solution. It's about choosing the most optimal solution based on what you have available and what you know you're going to build towards. So first and foremost, if you have crypto, inventorize those crypto assets, know what you have in-house, and increase that length of the key length of your current crypto that you're using now and the um, input. Secondly, look at your network. There may be some very specific places where you can already apply QKD. Again, this is already turning into common off-the-shelf technology. There are companies like ID Quantique in Europe, like Magic, uh, there's another company in Australia, they're all providing boxes that are rackable and stackable and you can already use them now to run a quantum communications setup. And thirdly, you know, I think that it, we've got to play and we have to fail and screw up with those post-quantum algorithms right now because we will not have the time to do that later. So that hybrid approach about not trying to figure out who's got it right, but about marrying the two things, that is the only approach I think that is possible. Uh, for the future. So again, like, what is QKD? Is there anyone that knows, like, as, if everyone says, fuck this, I don't need to do this, th is there anyone that says I want to know what it is? Oh, oh, okay. So um, Alice wants to talk to Bob. We all know Alice and Bob, friends, right? But then there's Eve, who always kind of gets in the way. It's menage a trois thingy. And, uh, or not menage a trois, that's not the uh, love triangle. That's what it did. Sorry, that was totally wrong. I, I don't know. Oh, sorry? The, okay. Uh, so the idea is Alice wants to talk to Bob, and um, there's basically a quantum channel in between. In order for Alice to have this quantum channel set up, she needs to go on a secondary offline channel. She needs to tell Bob how she set up her quantum channel. Um, if Eve's in the middle, she'll screw it up. So the what it really kind of looks like is everybody knows what, a, what polarized sunglasses are, right? So imagine, like, when you, when you turn your polarized sunglasses in a particular way, if you rotate it at an angle, sometimes it lets light in, other times it doesn't. Everybody knows what I'm talking about still, right? So that's basically uh, what Alice does. You have a single photon emitter, which is your photon source. It emits this photon. Alice has configured her polarizers in a particular uh, format. She communicates this over a secondary channel to Bob, an offline channel. Bob then sets up his polarizers in the same way to accept the communication from Alice. If Eve is in between their communications, she will screw it up. She will change the, the actual communication. As a result, Bob will get gibberish. It will not work. That's how they know they can detect the presence of Eve. And Eve can then use this mechanism to submit like key information, and then use it as communication channels as well. Are we clear? Yes. Oh, five minutes. Oh, I thought you had a question. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. So here's the problem with, with this setup. There are distance limitations. So unless you're in a lab setup where you could get with like some super awesome Dow Corning cable, 144 kilometers, um, you're really looking at like 62, 63 kilometers. So I don't know about you, but I tend to communicate with people that are more than 63 kilometers away from me. So that, that fundamental limitation is a limitation, but then there's this uh, ability to do something called free space QKD. Paulo Villarese, uh, University of Padua, set up a free space link between two islands in Tenerife, and even with the water vapor and everything, he, uh, sorry, two, uh, two islands in the Canary Islands, not in Tenerife, but um, even with the water vapor and everything, he uh, managed to bridge, that was like the 50, 154 kilometers. Even with that, it worked really well. But the problem is, this solution does not work during the day, or if it rains. And in Israel, it may not 
have this issue of rain so much, but um, th this is not always really uh, feasible for a lot of geographies and for consistent use, so you'd need to have time issues of how you do the free space stuff. Uh, China uh, has the world's first quantum communication satellite. It's pretty darn cool. They've also done a 2,000 long, and it's it's not end-to-end -end communications, uh, but it's node-to-node, -node, and it's using classical computers along the way to set up this uh, 2,000 kilometer link from Beijing to Shanghai, and it's basically hop-wise secure. So every hop is encrypted uh, to each other. Um, and then as a result, you just kind of you know, push the communication down the path. Um, and they did this because they wanted to be like safe in the event of a regional war. But actually, it's really interesting what they've done because they have had the most significant investment of any country in the world. Also, the amount of research money they have put into quantum is staggering. Like, per year, it's something like $10 billion. You know, Alibaba has set up all these separate labs just to do this research. It's impressive. Uh, at KPN, it's not so big. Um, so we have our own small quantum labs. It's run with uh, Phil Zimmerman, who uh, did PGP. So we have a cryptographer there at KPN. And we have a PhD in post-quantum uh, communications. And we had a, a, a separate PhD on quantum information systems. So we've chosen to specialize and choose exactly which things we do. In the Netherlands, uh, we are, KPN is building a quantum internet backbone. It's humble. It's only four cities. It's not big, but it's a start. And the difference between this is that it is fully quantum. So these four cities are not being connected on, uh, in terms of endpoints with classical computers, but actually there will be quantum computers on this end. So the University of Delft, Leiden, Amsterdam, and The Hague uh, will be communicating with uh, quantum computer, so it's a fully quantum network, and we want to use this to optimize uh, future networks. We also are engaged with uh, the NIST standardization. Uh, we are working with one of the submissions ourselves, uh, with Crystal Skyber, and what we've already done is uh, prototyped a post-quantum VPN solution. So we use uh, WireGuard, which is in the standard Linux distribution, so we figured that's the most applicable. Uh, we're using a combination of Michaelis and Kyber, uh, which is Peter Schwab by the way, it's still part of the round two. So NIST has like, you know, uh, like 89 initial candidates, then they like wind up to 63, round one, like a whole bunch of them are gone. And then uh, there was a second set of round two candidates. And right now, uh, Kyber, Crystal's Kyber and, and Dilithium, they're still part of the round two. And they're going to be decided in about August about, you know, what actually goes to the following set. Um, we also are working on a, with Tatu Lonan, the original creator of SSH, on a post-quantum version of SSH, as well as, because we've got Phil, a post-quantum version of PGP. So I think this is the cool space. If you'd like to help us on the post-quantum PGP stuff, and this is a shout out to you guys who are in the cybersecurity and uh, development community, please help us. You know, we will gladly accept helping hands to uh, do this right. And since we open source everything, so everything we build will be fully available open source for everyone. And I'd like you all to urge you to think about doing the same things. Take an inventory of those crypto assets, think it through for your readiness, you know, engage with your vendors to make sure they're thinking about it. Um, and then make sure you take that hybrid approach and start failing early. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe there are questions. Oh. Will we have a time for one or two quick questions?
for research money for uh, creating this flagship. Again, right, one billion, which is going to be spread out over a period of 10 years versus 10 billion per year from, for, from China. So I think, again, like all of our efforts, it's, I have to be very thankful that we do this effort in Europe. And it's really good. And again, as the vice chair of the Strategic Advisory Board, yay, in Europe. But when you look at the monumental effort that's there from the other countries, you really wonder uh, how will we be able to progress. The US? Uh, the U.S. is, oh, I think the biggest interesting thing in the U.S. is I see less of uh, a governmental approach other than like the NISTA, but I see a lot of private companies. So if there it feels like the race. It feels like, you know, because Google, Microsoft, IBM, they're all so heavily invested from the private sector. I think that's really interesting. And, and fundamentally, you know, like when I, when I speak to the people who are actually building, um, and again, I, I have the deepest respect for them that you realize what a monumental effort it is from like, fundamental physics to engineering um, so that we will require these individuals to build it. I don't think money alone will cover it. I don't, I don't know this for sure, but I don't know if there's going to be like that Manhattan project where you have a secret. I don't think it's that easy uh, looking at the sheer size of the challenge. Brain. They absolutely, and I think you need to have those brains. And the Manhattan Project was, you know, one of those few areas where you can keep it secret. The question is, can you do this and keep it a secret? All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again.